substantial difference. Even though the baby is going to start third spacing fluid, it's going to start urinating and doing things to kind of normalize itself, we still see probably about a 20 or 30 percent difference at four days in the baby's blood volume versus cord clamping. And interestingly, stripping the cord doesn't seem to get, get the baby as much volume as just leaving it on the cord and leaving it alone in this study. They also looked at the hematocrits of the baby. And this was a quite significant difference as well. If you look at four hours, you have a hematocrit of about 47% in the immediately clamped infants versus between 60 and 70% in the delayed clamped infants. And in this case, the top line is the cord stripping. And you'll notice that in the cord stripping, we get above 65% being our definition of uh, potentially too high hematocrits um, or polycythemia. And so inferring that delayed cord clamping maximizes infant's blood volume without potentially getting up into this polycythemic range that some people are concerned about. And that's something that people mention about delaying cord clamping is that we're going to create plethoric, jaundiced, polycythemic infants. Well, by not stripping the cord, we seem to stay below what we would consider to be that line. What about red cell volume? They look at total red blood cell volume. Again, you see a huge difference from about 30 milliliters per kilogram of total volume. Again, and now we're seeing greater than 50% increase in total red cell volume in a cord baby that has been left on the umbilical cord for three minutes. And in this case, immediate uh, delayed clamping versus cord stripping is about the same. And they looked at the rate at which this happens. If you look at 30 seconds, 60 seconds, up to about three minutes. And the important thing to point out is that about 50% of this placental transfusion occurs in the first minute. And a lot of people have talked about delaying cord clamping for about 45 seconds to a minute. And that's what some of the more modern studies have been, is delaying for 45 seconds to a minute. And even in that short time, you get about 50% about of the placental transfusion that's going to occur will occur in the first 60 seconds. And you look at all the animals I showed you, they're all leaving the baby on the cord for, you know, until the placenta comes out, really. And so even in a minute, you're getting 50% of whatever benefit there may be. So they showed about a 25% increase in blood volume, 45% increase in hematocrit, 50% increase in total red blood, red blood cell volume, and about 50% of this change is in the first 60 seconds, the remainder in the next two to five minutes. So this was a paper, and, and it, let me show you one other paper here. This was a paper that occurred before the one I just showed you. And these two papers were in controversy because they actually got a different result. This one was published in our journal, in the Green Journal, in 1957. And they looked at 38 term infants. And they clamped 11 of them immediately, they clamped 10 of them at five minutes with the infant held down below the placenta, about nine of them with the infant held up, and about eight of them with the leg clamping after milking the cord. Now they used a different method. They actually injected dye into the infant, and then they drew blood from the infant and they weighed the blood on a, on a very analytic measure, and they thought that they would be able to determine the baby's blood volume by the difference in the density of the blood because of this dye that they had injected. And interestingly, they got a completely different result. Uh, this line right here, the whites are blood volume, the next gray is plasma volume, the darker one is red cell volume, and then this bottom one's hemoglobin. And interestingly, they show that the infants have less blood volume and less everything when you delay clamping. A completely different result. This was the delayed infants held down. You actually had slightly less blood volume, slightly less again if it was held up, and you only showed a greater amount when the cord was milked. This is at 48 hours, where you'd show the three groups pretty much the same. And this is pretty strange. This created some, I, I would suspect this created controversy back then because these were two major studies that were completely different in result, but completely different in the way that they measured placental volume. Um, I, I tend to think that, that the, mes the method that they chose to measure fetal blood volume may not have been accurate given that they were trying to weigh the blood. But ultimately, when you have two studies, you, you've got to have a tiebreaker. And so, this one showed no difference in blood volume, no difference in plasma volume, no difference in red cell volume, no difference in hemoglobin mass, unless the cord was stripped. Um, so fortunately, we've had more studies and three, uh, yet another technique. Uh, this was uh, Alice Yao, was published in 1969, so this was about six years after that first one that I, that I mentioned. And what they did was actually did a little bit different. Rather than looking at the volume of the infant, they looked at how much blood was left in the placenta. And so once all the transfusion was over, they 
cut the cord, and they just drained every last bit of blood they could out of the placenta. And by looking at that, they presume that the average amount of blood left in the placenta will infer the average amount of blood that came to the baby. And they found data that was actually quite in correlation with the data that I mentioned in the first study. They looked at quite a few more infants, in this case 111 versus the only 20 or so that the other studies did. And they also put the infant on the bed about 10 centimeters beneath the placenta, and we'll talk about where the baby should be because that's been studied as well. And they also looked at different time frames, 5 seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 90 seconds, 120, and 180. And again, they measured placental transfusion by residual placental volume. And this is what they found. They found, again, data that would be much more consistent with that first study, which is that the longer you leave the umbilical cord clamped, the less blood there is in the placenta. And in correlation, the more blood there will be in the infant. And interestingly, you find data that is exactly in correlation with Usher's data, which would show that at 60 seconds, you get about half the transfusion. Right here at 60 seconds, again, you're going from 35 the bottom is about 15, so at 60 seconds you get exactly half the transfusion. So you have two completely separate studies done two completely different ways, getting exactly the same answer. And for that reason, I, I would strongly believe that this is the accurate data and that that one study done in 1959 was probably using a measuring technique that wasn't, didn't work. Because you have two completely different methods showing the same thing. And in one method they radiated the children, so that's got to be good. What about gravity? People ask, where should you put the baby? Or they say, well, if you put the baby on the baby's, on the mother's abdomen, aren't you going to drain blood into the placenta? And people even worry about that. Like, don't hold the baby up. You're going to lose the baby's blood. Well, this has been studied. It's a good question. So Yao went on to do another 112 infants after that study that we just talked about. They clamped the umbilical cord at 5 seconds, 30 seconds, or 3 minutes. And they held the baby at various heights. And they also did something interesting where they just clamped the umbilical arteries at 30 seconds in one group and then clamped the veins later to see, try to figure out when do those umbilical arteries stop pumping. So I've done a little Ted Turner on this graph because the original one you wouldn't be able to read very well. But on the vertical axis, you have the level of the baby relative to the placenta. So anything below the vertical axis, the baby is being held below the placenta. In this case, 10, 10 centimeters, 40 centimeters, and these would be above the placenta. So the first thing I want you to notice is that, first of all, the blue lines are babies that have had delayed clamping for three minutes. And the first thing I want you to notice is that whether the baby is 40 centimeters below the placenta, 10 centimeters below the placenta, or 10 centimeters above the placenta, which would be approximately on the baby's, on the mother's abdomen, you get the same effect. So it doesn't really matter. If you were to take the baby and put it on the mother's abdomen, you're going to get the same effect. And again, we say the same results that we saw in a previous study, that if you clamp the umbilical cord at five minutes, the mean placental volume was 120, versus if you clamp it at 30 seconds, we got a decreased amount in the residual placental volume. And if you clamp it three minutes, we got a further decreased amount in the placental volume. So another study confirming the same results. But now also showing us that in a certain range of height, it doesn't seem to matter. And, and this really makes some sense because it's not just an IV bag being hung at a certain level. You still have the fetus pumping blood through the placenta. And the other thing you have is that you have a differing, chain, differing time at which the umbilical veins, the umbilical arteries will close off. Because the umbilical arteries are muscular vessels that have some ability to spasm, whereas the veins are just loose vessels. And what they showed with this one here, which is what they, when they clamped the arteries early, was that at about in this and actually some related data, which I, I, could, you could, I could show you later if you like, at about 45 seconds, the umbilical arteries are pretty much not pumping anymore. And yet the umbilical veins continue to drain forever, really, because they're just loose veins. They don't have any muscles around them. And so at about 45 seconds, the, the delivery from the baby to the placenta has ceased. But then residual blood in the placenta will continue to come to the baby. So in those first 45 seconds to a minute, if the baby is held up, as long as it's held up low enough that the baby's pressure through the umbilical arteries is strong enough to get there, you shouldn't really affect placental transfusion at all. It's only when that pressure is greater than the pressure that the baby's heart is producing up the umbilical cord that we should see a substantial effect. And so this data would support that if you wanted to delay cord clamping and get this placental transfusion effect, 
putting the baby on the mother's belly is fine. So the last thing I want to talk about from a physiologic point of view is talk about and the idea of viscosity of the blood. You know, one thing that people are concerned about and some pediatricians are concerned about is are we making the babies very viscous? Are we going to make it potentially prothrombotic? Or are we going to make it plethoric? Or are we going to make it, uh, are we going to give it too high of a hematocrit or polycythemia? So this was a paper where they looked at the effect of early and late cord clamping on blood viscosity and other hemorrhoid hemorrhoidal parameters in uh, full-term neonates. And this was, a, again, a Scandinavian journal. This crazy Danes. Um, they looked at blood viscosity measurements in 30-term uh, infants. Uh, they delivered them. They del clamped the umbilical cord at 10 seconds or 3 minutes. They drew labs at 2 hours, 24 hours, and 5 days. And then they looked at plasma viscosity and blood viscosity. And this is what they found. And again, we have, again, confirmation of this, some of the same data. With early clamping, you have a much lower hematocrit than you have with late clamping. You see a substantial difference in a hematocrit, pretty much in line with what we saw before. You do see a higher blood viscosity, and this is an area that is, people are concerned about. Blood viscosity definitely goes up with late clamping relative to early clamping, but plasma viscosity doesn't seem to change at all. And so I have to leave it to the pediatricians to decide whether or not that's important or not, because it's not my area of expertise, but this is a measurable thing that you can see that delayed clamping is associated again with a higher fetal hematocrit, a little bit higher blood viscosity and delayed clamping. Um, they did see slightly higher bilirubin levels as well in the infants that had delayed clamping. Three out of those 15 infants had bilirubins greater than 15, whereas none of the ones that were immediately clamped had delayed or had elevated bilirubin levels. But there was no clinically significant polycythemia. And I've selected a few papers, but if I have about 30 on my laptop, and there's not a single paper that would suggest that there's any clinically significant polycythemia or jaundice associated with delayed clamping. There's a fair number of papers that will show a higher level of bilirubin and a higher level of laboratory diagnosed polycythemia, but there's no papers that show sick babies more often in delayed clamping. So in summary of this physiologic data, Delayed clamping associated with increased fetal red blood cell volume, increased red cell mass, decreased residual placental volume. Gravity doesn't seem to matter as long as the baby's about 10 to 20 centimeters, above, no higher than 10 to 20 centimeters above the placenta, and you have somewhat higher fetal blood viscosity. So we've talked about the cord physiology a little bit. Let's talk about some of the clinical impacts. 